All right, so in this video, we're going through the book of Hebrews, book of Hebrews. So, uh, first of all, we actually don't know who wrote Hebrews. There I am. We don't know. <laughs> uh, from the letter itself, it's clear that the writer must have had authority in the apostolic church and was an intellectual Hebrew Christian well-versed in the Old Testament. So, could be Barnabas, okay? He meets these requirements. He was a Jew of the priestly tribe of Levi. Uh, he became a close friend of Paul after Paul's conversion. And under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, the church at Antioch commissioned Barnabas and Paul for the work of evangelism and sent them off on the first missionary journey. So it's possible that Barnabas, this uh, friend of Paul's, this companion of Paul's, wrote the book. Uh, another leading candidate uh, for authorship is Apollos. Okay, Apollos was an Alexandrian by birth. He was a Jewish Christian, notable intellectual, and oratorical, that just means good at talking, abilities. Uh, and Luke tells us that he was a learned man with a thorough knowledge of the scriptures. And we also know that Apollos was associated with Paul in the early years of the church in Corinth. So maybe Apollos wrote it. Uh, over the time in history, other people have been suggested. Some people think Paul wrote it, uh, but he wrote it anonymously, which seems odd since all of Paul's other letters, he was very clear right up front, right? Paul, <laughs> Apostle of Jesus Christ, writing too. Um, so Paul's, I don't think Paul's very likely. Some people actually think it was a woman that maybe Priscilla wrote it, and that was why it's anonymous, because women weren't seen very highly. Um, a lot of different ideas. Ultimately, we don't know. It's the only book in the New Testament that we don't know who wrote it. Um, but the, the content is so sound and the theology is so on point that the early Christians decided, you know what, even though we don't know who wrote it, it was clearly written by someone with apostolic connection. So we're going to include it. And uh, personally, I think Apollos is probably the best, the best candidate. But here's some um, from biblical.com some reasons why Barnabas and Apollos might have been the author. But ultimately, ultimately, if this was a multiple choice question, the author is unknown. Okay, uh, date, also unknown, but we can narrow it down. It was sometime before 70 AD, okay? Also unknown, but sometime before 70 AD. Why? Uh, it was written before 70 AD because it makes a lot of references to the temple and the priesthood and the sacrificial system. And it talks about those things in the present tense, as if those things are happening right now. Um, and we know that in 70 AD, the temple, there's a nice little picture there, the temple was destroyed, okay? And so for these things to be talked about in the present tense, it wouldn't make sense if it was written after 70 AD because they would have made a point. Like one, the whole section of the book, the whole point is, you don't need to go make sacrifices anymore at the temple. Well, if the temple was destroyed and nobody could make sacrifices there, the author wouldn't have had to write that, right? The author would have written, see, you can't make sacrifices anymore because the temple's been destroyed. So, um, yeah, much of the letter showing how Jesus is greater than the priesthood and the sacrifices. So if the temple had been destroyed, the author either would have used this as an example to prove their point or just wouldn't have included that section in the letter at all. So we don't know exactly who wrote it, but we know that whoever wrote it, wrote it before 70 AD. Okay, uh, who was it written to? Audience, Jewish Christians. Jewish Christians, hence the name Hebrews, right? Hebrews is a word for the Jewish people, going all the way back to uh, as they were Hebrews in slavery in Egypt, right? They were called Hebrews. This letter is written to Christians who have this Jewish background specifically. Um, unlike other letters, Hebrews doesn't start with a formal greeting. So like we said, doesn't start Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, to the church in Philippi. Um, so we don't have a specific audience, but because of the way that it's written, um, message of the letter, uh, it's clear that the audience is people who are well-versed in the Old Testament and were familiar with things like the temple, the priesthood, the sacrificial system, and were maybe tempted to keep engaging in those things. That's why the author is writing and saying, no, no, no. We don't need the temple anymore. We don't need the priesthood anymore. We don't need to offer sacrifices anymore. All of that has been fulfilled in Christ. Um, okay, so we're gonna look at a couple of important passages. Uh, this one, important passage, Hebrews chapter 10, verses 11 through 14. 
says day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. And since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. For by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Okay, so again, you can see how it's talking about the sacrifices as if it's ongoing, right? Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. This is something that was ongoing at the time of writing. Uh, the he being described here is Jesus. Jesus is the greater high priest. Jesus is the greater sacrifice, right? He doesn't need to offer his sacrifices day after day because he offered one sacrifice himself once and for all. The other interesting thing about this passage, why we're looking at it as a key passage, is because there's this tension between being made perfect and being made holy, right? It says, for by one sacrifice he has, past tense, made perfect forever, those who are being present ongoing made holy. How do we reconcile those two things? How can something be done and still be going on? Well, let's talk about that. Uh, it's a theological concept, this idea of justification, sanctification, glorification. Those are some really nice theology vocab words for you. Justification, sanctification, glorification. You can see in the little uh, picture there, justification, past tense, separation from the penalty of sin. Sanctification, present tense, separation from the power of sin. Glorification, future tense, separation from the presence of sin. Okay, so this is a way to understand what it means to be a Christian. Christians have been justified, they are being sanctified, and they look forward to one day being glorified. Let's take a little bit of a deeper dive into these words. Justification, what does that mean? It means being made right, or being made righteous before God, okay? And it's actually a legal term, and it's describing how God views sinners as innocent. All right, and that's why they got a little judge gavel there in that picture to help you remember justification is God, the judge, declaring you are righteous, okay? People are sinners. We sin. We do bad things, right? But when you put your faith in Christ and you become a Christian, because of what Jesus did on the cross, God says, I don't see you as a sinner anymore. I declare you innocent. I declare you righteous, okay? Now, that doesn't mean you become perfect automatically, right? We still have sin. We still have problems, but God has declared based on what Jesus did. Now I see you as righteous. I don't see your sin on you anymore. Over time, okay, just like a sculptor sculpting a piece of clay into a statue, over time, people who have received this new life in Christ actually start to look more and more like Christ. This idea of the Holy Spirit enters into our lives and over time actually starts to make us righteous. As a Christian, the longer you're a Christian, the more you should be aware of your own sin. You should be seeking to remove the sin from your life and be more righteous and sin less. Uh, and, and someone who has the Holy Spirit working in their life, they should sin less than someone who doesn't uh, over the course of their lifetime, right? Now that's, again, not all at once, but over the course of their lifetime, someone who's really a Christian, who really has a relationship with God, should start to look more and more like God. And so if there's someone you're thinking of who claims to be a Christian and has been a Christian for a long time, and they don't look any more like God than they did at the beginning, um, you know, they need to kind of check their heart a little bit and see if, if what they're saying is true really is. All right, the last one here, glorification. Sorry, I keep moving my little bubble all around, but I want you guys to see the words. Um, glorification, future. This is what Christians are looking forward to. When Jesus returns and the final judgment takes place, believers will become completely what they were declared to be 
through justification. So God said, past tense, you are righteous. Throughout your life, you are becoming more and more and more righteous. And one day we look forward at the end of life when Jesus comes back, we will actually be righteous. There will no longer be any sin. We won't do bad stuff anymore. We will actually be perfect, just like God has already declared us to be. And so for all eternity, followers of Jesus will be like him, holy and without sin. And that's what all Christians are looking forward to. So that's how the author of Hebrews can say that Jesus has made perfect those who are being made holy. It's that past tense, present tense tension. And we actually see it in a lot of books of the Bible. All right, one more important uh, passage. This is Hebrews 11. Uh, sometimes it's called the Hall of Faith, like a Hall of Fame. Get it? Uh, and this is where Old Testament figures are listed and discussed as examples of faith. And there's this kind of repeating, by faith, Abel, blah, 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 blah. By faith, Enoch, blah, 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 blah. By faith, Noah, blah, 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 blah. So Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Rahab, Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets are all listed as examples of um, what God can accomplish through people by faith. And it kind of recounts these major stories of the Old Testament as an encouragement, right? By faith, these people did these things. And so by faith, we can follow God and do things too. All right, that is the book of Hebrews. Um, we're going to be looking at James with some uh, kind of activities on Friday. So look forward to that. This is your only play posit this week. So make sure if you're behind on play posits, you're taking the time to catch up. Okay? All right.